So these are the opening pages of the uh, story. It's called Mr. Canada. A year after my family's arrival in Canada, I stood in our basement looking at my reflection in the mirror. The, pl the powder blue wearing was part of my work uniform and it made me look sallow, a pallidness intensified by the neon light above. The mirror was a collection of reflecting squares stuck together on the basement wall in an area that had once been the bar. Some of the squares were missing and, as I, and I saw myself in fragments. I could see my head but not my neck, my left arm but not my right. My left leg was missing too. In that disjointed mirror was a view of my basement bedroom as well. The plastic wood veneer paneling which was supposed to create a warm coziness, did not absorb the light like real wood, but reflected the neon tube above. The carpet was a worn lime green. My bed was a box spring mattress that was here when we bought the house. A rickety desk from towers was shoved up against a wall. It was the summer of 1985, a hot summer, and as I walked towards the bus stop, the summer sun beat down a yellow heat that glared off the pavements and the concrete apartment towers. Someone had kicked over a can of pop on the pavement and wasps were thick on the blood black liquid. There was a queue at the bus stop on Finch Avenue and I took my place at the end of it. Sweat had begun to collect in the space between my knapsack and the back of my shirt. The synthetic material resisted moisture and the sweat trickled down my waistband soaking the edge of my underwear. This part of Finch Avenue that had no shade to it, had no shade to it. The spindly trees that grew in squares of cut out pavement, imprisoned by iron bars to prevent any desecration to them, were no taller than I was. My bus ride to Finch Avenue took 30 minutes. From there I had another ride north for 40 minutes. By the time I boarded my second bus, I could feel a tightness across the back of my neck from the heat and gas fumes. As the bus trundled up Young Street, I stared out at the strip malls and used car dealerships coated with sickly yellow sunlight. It had been a dry summer and the grass along the side of the pavements was burnt brown. I glanced at my watch. I had been on the bus for only 10 minutes, but it felt like an hour. I closed my eyes, there was still a while to go. The vastness of Canada, the enormous distances that lay between things, was something my mind could not get itself around. It recoiled from the notion, the interminable distances like some physical affliction. When I next looked up, I saw a brown brick apartment building in the distance, like forbidding mountains, and before them the Hillcrest Mall, a long, low, windowless, windowless building that reminded me of a penitentiary. At the Hillcrest Mall stop, the bus filled up, people standing in the aisles. A boy of about 17 stood in front of my seat. As the bus began to move, his hips swayed towards me and then away. I glanced at the bulge of his crotch, the way it pushed his fly slightly apart, revealing the zipper. I longed to see the boy's face and I looked sideways and then quickly upwards. The boy caught my glance by accident. My eyes hurriedly slid away. He was handsome with a glowing tan and white blondish hair. He had put his hands in his pocket and his knuckles pressed out the material of his jeans. I imagined what it would be like to be that hand, resting against the heat of his thigh. The bus was pulling up a hill. We were going into the old village of Richmond Hill with its narrow main street the low building was on either side, run down and dingy, the windows dusty. A billiard room here, a dime store there, the town hall in need of a coat of paint, a strip joint named Girls Galore. My stop was the next one. I got down and began to walk east along High Tech Road, past car repair garages, a socks factory, a piece of wasteland with knee-high grass growing in it. I had a job at the new Richmond Motel in housekeeping. The building had a mock Tudor facade and sat on a large tarred lot, a few dusty shrubs along the edge. 
Behind the building was a scrubland and beyond that warehouses. The motel was owned by an Indian family, the Lalwanis, and had been built in the 1970s in anticipation of commercial development along High Tech Road that had never materialized. It would have been shut down were it not for the business provided by Girls Galore. Most of the motel's occupants were strippers who lived here on a permanent basis. When I came in through the front doors, I was enveloped in a smell of stale cigarettes and old beer. I went down a dark hallway with fake wood paneling, paneling on either side, the shag carpets, a grubby orange and rust, and entered the reception room area. Mrs. Zalvani and her older son, Harish, were in the glassed-in office behind the reception desk. The younger son, Deepak, was on the desk at duty, and he gave me a timid smile as I went past him.